that at one time or another, we all lived in this apartment? Oh, yeah, that's true. These videos are not for children. If you are a children, then piss off. Hey there, I'm Vin Fuso, and I know a bunch of you are already seething in the comments section, so allow me to do this for you. And I know just the guys to do it. Friends never died, it was always good. The only thing dying is this channel. Oh, and fuck Ross. They were on a break! Friends? Friends was trash. Basura. Dark Seinfeld's way better. Friends always sucked. It died the day it was created. You know that Friends is just a white remake of Living Single, right? Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's discuss. Friends was a very popular sitcom back in the day. And in present day, it's currently very unpopular with people on the internet. If it's not someone claiming that the show is toxic or immoral, then it's people in my comment section just saying it sucks. And I don't get that. Look, I'm not going to claim the show was the pinnacle of entertainment, but let's not all act like it was awful either. It was a simple premise that was made larger than life by a cast who genuinely seemed like they were real friends. And given the fact that 20 years later they still meet up from time to time, I'd say it's a pretty safe bet that they are. Or they're all just really, really deep method actors. For me personally, what made the show work and what made it so iconic two decades later is the relationships of the leads. There's just something really organic about the friends of Friends. Their relationships seem legitimate. And the world of Friends seems real. Though I will say their depiction of New York leaves a little bit to be desired. For example, there's a lot more black people living here than this show would have you believe. And there's significantly more cursing and just overall unpleasantness. And trust me, I should know, I've been here for a while. And it's all from here. This video is really different from the others I've done in this series before. And it's also probably different from the ones I do after as well. Two and a Half Men, How I Met Your Mother, and That 70s Show were all shows that went downhill. Pretty noticeably. They were all good, but they got bad real fast. But I honestly can't say the same for Friends. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's definitely a drop in quality in the later seasons of the series when compared to the earlier seasons. But I wouldn't exactly say it was a plunge. It's more like a three-foot drop, and they still managed to land directly on their feet. Are you all right? Yeah. Yes, it's a drop in quality, but it's not a complete nosedive. So no, I wouldn't say that the later seasons were bad, but I would say maybe they were a little bit lacking. The story suddenly becomes somewhat less interesting, but again, it's the characters' personalities and the dynamics with each other that really keeps this series going. Yeah, the show kind of loses some of its depth, and some of the newer creative decisions are uh, not necessarily good. I'll admit, the last two or three seasons, it gets kind of bad. And not just bad, but it gets, it gets kind of weird. Like take for example, Ross trying to make a move on his cousin. His flesh and blood cousin. Yeah, that happens. Or when it's later revealed that Ross was actually Monica's first kiss. That's Monica, his sister. So apparently Ross was just stroking down his own family tree. There's a little bit more context to that story, but I'm just, I'm just gonna leave you with that. There's plenty of other examples of strange or just downright unpleasant stories. Like Rachel hiring and then pursuing her assistant. It's substantially less weird, but uh, just, it's still up there in the bad category. No offense to Tag, but he just... Uh, he, he, he was just kind of there. And while that's not the greatest story, I guess it's not nearly as weird as the time Ross dated one of his students. You know, actually, looking back on this show in hindsight, Ross is, um... He, he gets a little creepy, doesn't he? Then there's Ross getting upset over Rachel hiring a male nanny. 
Monica thinking Chandler's into shark porn. Frank Reynolds playing a male stripper. You know what? I actually might have filed that in the wrong section because clearly that that's a W. That's a win right there. I mean, you gotta love Danny. You like what you see? Hmm? There's the Ross tanning incident. Joey finding his identical hand twin. Clearly there were some stinkers. And I think the majority of the worst episodes happened in the last three or four seasons. But I gotta say, even these episodes still kind of hold up. They're still entertaining. So yes, there was definitely a decline of friends. But it wasn't a massive decline. A trope with almost any long-running TV series is the flanderization of characters. Flanderization being a term named after the Simpsons character Ned Flanders. And for a better description, I look to the ultimate higher power for answers, Google. Flanderization is the act of taking a single, often minor, action or trait of a character within a work and exaggerating it more and more over time until it completely consumes the character. Most always, the trait, action becomes completely outlandish and it becomes their defining characteristic. Long story short, it means bottling a character down to just a trait or a quirk. So flanderization hit this show pretty hard. Joey was always a little bit dumb, but now suddenly he's too stupid to function. He was also a little immature, but by the time the series comes to a close, he was suddenly a child trapped inside a grown man's body. Oh, and he eats a lot. That's, that's very important to his character. Both Gellers, Monica and Ross, become a lot more whiny and kind of annoying as the show rolls on. I think both of them really get the shaft in the later episodes. They're made almost entirely unlikable. But because they have that longevity in our hearts, we, we, we put up with them. We remember better days. Monica comes off as an angry shrew, and Ross comes across as an easily offended, immature brat. That man is a doctor, he's a paleontologist! I don't remember disliking Ross this much the first time around when I watched the show, but watching it back now, there's just a couple moments where I'm watching and I'm thinking, uh, really? Why? But why though? It's not like I hate the character, but I just feel after binge watching the show, I've been overexposed to him. You know, I just, I just, I, we, we need some time apart. Some sort of uh, a break, if you will. And that's no offense to David Schwimmer. Because I actually have friends like this too. I love them. I, I really, I do. I love spending time with them. But you know, not too much time. Like, I, 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 could, I could live with you, but I, I, can't, I can't live with you. Ross suffers from the same problems that Ted does in How I Met Your Mother. And that makes him completely unsufferable toward the end of the show. He's easily agitated, he's always upset, all he seems to do is bitch. Bitching and moaning and bitching and bitching and bitching and bitching. And then he seems to have this really strange obsession with Rachel. Like, earlier on, it, it, it's almost cute. He's a shy dude with a long-term crush. But at some point, it's just like, uh, move the fuck on, man. In later seasons, Rachel tries to pursue Ross, but he doesn't seem to be interested in anything but... But, 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 but sax. And no, that's not me censoring myself, he, he's just really into jazz music. Despite telling her he's not interested, he continues to get all up in his feelings anytime she starts seeing someone new. Like, come on, man. Look, buddy, you can't have your cake and not eat it too. Most of the main cast seem to kind of shrink down to just one or two characteristics. Though thankfully, Chandler and Phoebe seem to be unaffected by the flanderization of the series. Side note, the way the characters react to Chandler as a kid led me to feel like he was the most annoying character on the show. But all these years later, re-watching this as a sarcastic, cynical adult, I gotta say, he's my favorite part of the whole series. Before I get into some of the bigger issues I have with the show, let me rattle off a couple nitpicks I have with the series. There's a couple annoying inconsistencies that I can normally look past, but there's one that always bugs me. And that's Joey's money situation. He's poor, he's rich, he's poor, he's rich. Listen, pick a lane and stick with it. At first, when Joey's a struggling actor, it makes sense for him to be broke. But then he lands the role of Dr. Drake Ramore in a hit soap opera, and his money situation just doesn't seem to budge. Eventually, the group does make mention of him having more money than the rest of them, and they even allude to him being somewhat rich. But it's like, the show can't decide if he is or he isn't. One season, he's telling Chandler he can't pay him back for headshots and acting lessons, and the very next season, 
He's lending $4,000 to Monica and Chandler. And nothing changed in between those two seasons. Then he moves out to LA and suddenly he's back to being broke. Writers, make up your minds. And Joey's money isn't the only thing on the show that seems to fluctuate. The ages of the characters do too. Joey is referred to being both 31 and 30 in the same season. And then the next season he's said to be 32. Monica is said to be the youngest of the group, yet when Rachel turns 30 we see a flashback of Monica turning 30. And Ross, don't even get me started with him, he can't even remember his own birthday. Being as he gives two or three different dates throughout the series run. The timeline and continuity of the show seems to change on an episode to episode basis. And for someone like me who enjoys ongoing storytelling and also binge watching entire shows, it's kind of annoying. I mean, by the end of the show, Chandler and Rachel meet no less than three different times. Did nobody on the writing team watch the previous seasons? I always felt like the show didn't typically give its leads memorable love interests outside of themselves. I mean, yeah, you got your Richards, you got your Janices, but outside of them, everyone else is just a blank slate with all the emotional range of a cardboard cutout. And when the show actually does create entertaining significant others for the central perk gang, it does a crappy job of writing them off. Like when they pair Phoebe up with a cop played by Michael Rappaport. Their conflicting lifestyles makes for an interesting dynamic, but it ends suddenly when he decides to shoot a bird. Okay. Oh, and this one also annoys me, and it annoys me even more that nobody thinks to bring this up, but it seems like once a season they found a new reason to do a clip show episode. And that gimmick got old pretty quick. I think typically the most clip shows a series can have is, is, is two, and even then it, it's kind of pushing it. You already did this once before. But friends, I mean, just every season. And I'm hardly exaggerating here. There's one in season four, and then there's one each season from season six to ten. Six clip shows. It's, it's just a little bit excessive. Just go out and film some new shit, you lazy bastards. Anna Faris shows up, and honestly, her talent kind of feels wasted here. She doesn't really get to be funny, and she doesn't really have any memorable lines outside of this one. Oh man, this hurts! Really? That bad? Uh-huh! I think it's time to kick you in the nuts and see which is worse! She's just a plot point to give Monica and Chandler a baby. Having a main cast of six often meant that some of its leads fell into secondary roles. Phoebe, Joey, and even sometimes Chandler can come off as supporting characters from time to time. There's not too many stories that are centered around them. From time to time, they come off as bit players who are given top billing. There's also a couple of out-of-character moments that I think kind of paints the group in a really negative light. Monica wants to spend all of Chandler's life savings on their wedding. Rachel becomes unreasonably angry over boat etiquette with Joey. Joey sabotages an up-and-coming actor who looked up to him as a mentor. And Ross... Well, well, Ross is just Ross. Seriously, I did not remember him being this bad. It, it is hard to watch. I would give the guy a column all to himself, but I've already spoken about him so much in this review that it would just be me repeating myself. More than I already do. Of course, none of these things ruin the show. Well, except maybe for the Ross thing a little bit. They're just nitpicks and minor qualms I have with the series as a whole. Let me just say this now. I love Paul Rudd. Paul, if you're listening, slide into my DMs. I mean, nothing's gonna happen, but I would just like the ability to tell people that Paul Rudd slid into my DMs. I feel like it's gonna open a lot of doors for me. Paul Rudd played the character of Mike, a guy who went on a blind date with Phoebe, and the guy who winds up being her happily ever after. I'm not gonna say that there's no chemistry between the two, because that's not entirely accurate. There's some, there, there's definitely some. I mean, they're cute together, but just in general, this whole plot seems tacked on. I could buy Mike and Phoebe as a couple, but I have a real hard time believing that he's the one for her. Everything about this story just feels rushed. Joey's supposed to get Phoebe a date, he forgets, and then he just picks some random guy hanging out at Central Perk. Thank God it was the dude from Clueless. They get together and a few episodes later, they're already talking about moving in together. Eventually, the topic of marriage is brought up, and Mike makes it known that he doesn't want to get married again, after having gone through a rough divorce. But then Phoebe's ex comes back and asks her to marry him, and Mike counters his offer. And just like that, all his reservations were gone, and he'd later marry her that same season. It doesn't seem like Mike's fears ever got resolved. He just offered to marry Phoebe as a way to make sure that he didn't lose her. Their whole story just kind of irks me. 
It feels like this poor divorced dude got coerced into remarrying. I think in the grand scheme of the show, David probably would have made more sense. And it's his longevity with the series, as well as the character's history with Phoebe, dating back to the first season of the show, that led to his occasional returns. And even two potential teases of the characters getting back together. David's actor Hank Azaria shares my opinion as well, as he too thought David should have ultimately ended up with Phoebe. The man played the stuttering, unconfident, nerdy scientist to perfection. And he played the part so well that you've probably forgotten that he only showed up for five episodes. Which surprised the hell out of me! because I just came off binge-watching the whole series, and I could've swore he was around for longer. But ultimately, his presence was just felt more. He genuinely impacted Phoebe and viewers of the show. Now, in contrast, Paul Rudd's character, Mike, was on the series for two seasons, and it don't feel anywhere near that long. It just, it just went by. In my opinion, David and Phoebe just sorta of seem to work together. Still love you though, Paul. Ross and Rachel were the ultimate will-they-or-won't-they couple. They were the main pairing of the show, and throughout the years, they ate up a good chunk of the show's screen time. Rachel was Ross's high school crush, and that was a crush that went disregarded until years later, they bonded, formed a meaningful friendship that blossomed into something else entirely. It seemed like they were destined to end up together, and fans worldwide shipped them. Until we didn't anymore. Ross and Rachel's relationship was thrown through the ringer. They dated, they broke up, they dated, Ross cheated on her. We were on a break! They got married, they got divorced, all in 10 seasons. And for a while, it was compelling. But after a while, it seemed like the writers were just desperate to keep these two apart. You see, there's this theory that when writing a show, no one wants to see a couple be a couple. They want to see the chase, they want to see what leads to that relationship. So more often than not, writers will throw more and more obstacles in the way of our leads in an attempt to prolong the inevitable. I don't necessarily agree with that mentality because I think there are, in fact, some exceptions to this alleged rule. I mean, there's Jim and Pam from The Office. I think that they were just as much fun to watch together as they were, you know, coming together. Not, not, not sexually. And then there's Monica and Chandler from this very show that I think are just as much fun to watch together as they were getting together. Anyway, when it came to Ross and Rachel, the show just kept developing new ways to keep them apart. They were on again, they were off again, and they were on again, again, and then they were off again, again, and then they were on again, 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 and then they were off again, again. You know what? I'm gonna... You understand where I'm going with this. You get the point. And it was about as thrilling as that last sentence sounded. The process became so repetitive and so exhausting that I just stopped rooting for them. Don't get me wrong, they were destined to reunite again. And even as a kid watching this, I knew that they'd wind up with each other. And I wouldn't have written that any other way. The way the story was set up, the amount of time devoted to their relationship, it only made sense that Ross would end up with Rachel. But man, the show kind of made it a little bit, just, just that much harder to to get on board with that idea. You play with our emotions too much. We're, we're no longer invested. We've been through the ringer with them. I guess to the show's credit, they did lay off the pairing for a good while. Having the two split for five years, with little hints and allusions to both parties harboring feelings for the other, they were definitely in some form or fashion hung up on the other. And they were more often than not jealous of the other's significant others. But I don't know, I guess I kind of felt that they spent too much time apart. For me personally, the will they or won't they couple became the I don't care if they do or don't couple. What is wrong with us? Oh, look what you've done. If you asked any Friends fan, any at all, what their least favorite moment of the show was, almost all, if not all of them, would respond with Joey and Rachel. The random romance between two friends who had been platonic for years really rubbed viewers the wrong way. I mean, yeah, sure, they flirted a couple times in the past, but that's because this is Joey and he flirts with everybody. Joey and Rachel had been friends for eight years, and they'd been roommates for a little while now. And seemingly out of nowhere, they decide they don't just like each other, they like like each other. With Rachel's pregnancy hormones going wild, she's tempted to sleep with Joey, because I mean, let's face it, everyone else has. Later on, they decide to go on a friendly date, where Joey catches feelings for Rachel. These feelings grow over the course of the next few episodes. 
leading him to look to his friends for advice, who all keep his secret. Joey is shown to be a lot more selfless and compassionate when he's with Rachel, very often putting her and the baby's needs before his own. Him being there so much for her makes Ross upset, because he feels that he's missing so much of his unborn child's soon-to-be life. So knowing this, Joey decides it's best for Rachel to move in with Ross so they can experience her pregnancy together. The distance between him and Rachel leads to him falling into a bit of a depression, and this only reaffirms how he feels about her, leading to Joey eventually telling Ross and then finally confessing to Rachel. Rachel lets Joey down easy. Their friendship returns to normal for a while before Joey accidentally proposes to Rachel. You see, it's actually Ross's ring, but Ross wasn't necessarily going to propose. There's more context to that, but I'm just going to leave it there. Not important. Rachel actually accepts his non-proposal, but at the start of Season 9, things get cleared up. But later in that same season, Rachel winds up leaving Ross's and moving back in with Joey. Now, whereas Season 8 was focused on Joey's secret feelings for Rachel, Season 9 was focused on Rachel's secret feelings for Joey. She spends the whole season pining for the guy she already knew was pining for her, but still doesn't tell him because... I, I don't know. Joey winds up dating Charlie, who's played by Aisha Tyler, who's one of the most gorgeous women I've ever seen in my life. It's not really relevant to what I'm talking about right now, I just, I just thought, I just thought I'd share a little bit about me with, with you, so now you know that about me. You're welcome. Ross and Charlie bond, and it turns out the two have a lot in common, especially when compared to Joey and Charlie, who have absolutely nothing in common. Long story short, Charlie and Joey break up, Charlie and Ross start dating, and Joey and Rachel start dating, which deeply affects Ross. So with the two-season buildup, it might surprise you to know that Joey and Rachel only officially dated for about a week. They wound up calling it quits because they couldn't sleep with each other. Which again, is hard for me to believe considering Joey would sleep with... Uh, just about anybody. Two seasons and change for a romantic week. I think what surprises me even more than the fact that they spent so much time building up this relationship and then just completely swept it under the rug is that they continue to build up this relationship for that amount of time despite the fan base being very vocal in their hatred of this story. So really, who, who is this for? The Joey pursuing Rachel story was immediately rejected by its core fan base, who pretty much felt that this was blasphemy. But Friends Friends, I'm just, I'm, I'm assuming that that's the name of the Friends fan base, Friends Friends? Friends of Friends, I don't, I don't know. But people who watched Friends weren't alone in their hatred. Because both Jennifer Aniston and Matt LeBlanc, Rachel and Joey's actors, protested the story. Neither were fond of the angle, and didn't think the fan base would be either. But of course, their concerns were brushed off, and the arc managed to last three seasons. Starting in Season 8, and ending at the beginning of Season 10. That seemed worth it. Despite the prolonged buildup, after the breakup, there was no looking back. Joey moved on, and Ross and Rachel got back together. No lingering feelings. They just move on and act like nothing ever happened. The story was very quickly swept under the rug, and no more mentions or references to it were ever made. It seemed like those behind the scenes realized their mistake, albeit a, a little bit too late. Several seasons too late. In my opinion, I don't think this story is quite as bad as others think it is, but I'm not going to be sitting here singing its praises either. I think this would have been fine had it not been the focus of the show, and didn't have the longevity that it did, and didn't come this late in the series. If this happened earlier on, I think it would have been fine. Don't get it twisted, I still do categorize this as a low point in the show's run. And at times when re-watching it, it could just be downright painful, and almost cringe-inducing. Joey and Rachel had no chemistry. It was really a tough sell to say these two suddenly had romantic feelings for each other. I think what makes matters even worse is that they didn't just start to like each other. This was played off as the two of them falling in love with each other. Those aren't my words, Joey drops the L-bomb himself. And that's Joey, the brain-dead ladies man who is typically interested in no pants, not romance. I don't know why they decided to do this story against the actor's request, against the audience's complaints, and against the betterment of the show. I, I, I don't know why, but they did. They did. And damn did they devote a hell of a lot of time to it. And, and, and here's my biggest gripe here. And I don't know if anybody can relate. Maybe, maybe, maybe you disagree. But you put Joey with Rachel, but you never thought of putting Joey with Phoebe? They were practically playing the same character. The groundwork was already laid out for you. 
They flirt all the time. They seem to have a connection. I mean, I guess I understand not wanting to end your show with all of the main cast ending up together. That would be a little, I don't know, far-fetched. But seriously, this is baffling. How you doing? <laughs> If there's anything I can credit this show for, it's, in my opinion, having one of the best endings in the history of TV shows. They sent all their characters off properly. It's definitely not the end of their journey, but it's the end of their time together. Look, all I'm saying is that they're not going to get together every week to go to Central Perk anymore. I'm sure they all stayed friends, but they were all moving on with their lives. They weren't going to be seeing each other as often as they were. They were all taking the next steps. Phoebe and Mike got married, Chandler and Monica just became parents and were now moving to Westchester, Ross and Rachel officially got back together and were now moving to Paris to raise Emma. Everyone got a perfect ending to their story. Well, everyone except for Joey. Which leads us to this. When Friends was coming to an end, producers looking to cash in on the series' success went to Jennifer Aniston and asked if she'd be willing to do a spin-off with David Schwimmer to which she declined, as she was looking to start a family with then-husband Brad Pitt. Then they approached Courtney Cox and Matthew Perry about doing a spin-off, and they similarly declined. They then turned their heads to the nearest person, which just so happened to be Matt LeBlanc, and instead, they gave him a show. If only Gunther was on set that day, then we really would have been given something entertaining. So I may be cheating in bringing this up, but to me, more than Ross's Rossisms, more than the Joey and Rachel pairing, more than a misused Paul Rudd, the show Joey is the biggest black mark on the Friends series. I guess a part of the problem is that Joey wasn't a leading character. He was part of an ensemble cast. What I'm trying to say is that he was a piece of the puzzle. He wasn't the puzzle himself. Through no fault of Matt LeBlanc, by the way, this is strictly the Joey character we're talking about. The Joey character was an easy character to write for, sure. But writing him as a series lead would be a lot more challenging. Which is probably why the show decided to completely rewrite his character from scratch. Joey is suddenly no longer charismatic or charming. He somehow lost his way with women. Which kind of goes against his whole character. He was a ladies man and a womanizer. And that was almost all the character development he got in 10 years. Despite having been established to have money, he's now back to being broke. For no rhyme or reason. And despite being established as a semi-successful actor, now those parts were fewer and far in between. All those friends who played a huge part in his life for the last decade? Ah, eh, forget them. Who cares? Don't even bring them up. Not worth it. They're not important. This is Joey. We want to know more about Joey and his retconned family. Yeah, you remember that, sister? No, of course you don't. But, but you're gonna now. We recast her and made her look entirely different from the way Joey's sisters looked before, but who cares? It doesn't matter. No, no one's watching this shit anyway. And I do intend on exploring why in more depth on this channel, but perhaps that's a story for another time. Contributing degenerates, you already know how this goes. Let me know in the comment section below if you'd like to view me reviewing the show Joey. It won't be fun for me. It won't be pleasant. I won't enjoy myself, but... Alas, that's my burden to bear, being a YouTuber comes with sacrifices. So now if I have to sit here and try to pinpoint when exactly I think Friends died, the truth of the matter is, is I don't think it ever did. Which might kind of go against the grain of what this series has been and will continue to be, but like I said earlier, there was definitely a decline in the episodes. The later seasons aren't as good as the earlier seasons, but they're not bad either. They definitely still have rewatch value. Most of them still hold up, even if a couple jokes here and there in the episodes don't. And people are using very, very ancient artifacts for cell phones. Friends at its absolute worst is still Friends. So ultimately, I don't think Friends really ever died. Unless we're also counting the show Joey, because if that's the case, then Friends absolutely died the day that that show was created. It was not good. For anybody. Except for maybe Matt LeBlanc, who, who made away with a couple more hefty paychecks. Good on you, Matt. You get your money. I don't want to harp on this too much, but the show was so bad that Matt LeBlanc actually retired from acting temporarily for about four years. That bad. 
So with that being said, that was the day friends died. Thank you all for tuning in. And I've been getting a whole lot of requests from you guys as to which video I should make next. And I want that to continue. I do read my comments. But I figured now at the end of these videos, I can at the very least tell you what's gonna come next. So the next installment in the day blank died will be The Office. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Oh, and by the way, they were on a break. Ross did nothing wrong. Thank you, Vgenerates, and leave your angry responses in the comment section below. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Alex Jones, and we are breaking the conditioning. Now look, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm kind of retarded, which is why I liked and subscribed to the Social Injustice Warriors channel. I even clicked that little bell to stay notified. You have to look into it, people. But then I began to uncover what I believe to be a secret nefarious plot orchestrated by Zionist reptilians. Now give me a second, digging deep. I discovered that he wants you to quote unquote follow him on Twitter. Now think about that for a minute. What kind of person, what sort of individual wants you to follow them? You know who else wanted people to follow them? The world's biggest Beach Boy fan, <laughs> Charles Manson. <sighs> Those who want to show their support, donate to the guy's Patreon for exclusive content. Now, why is it so exclusive? What's this guy hiding from the public? What do those Patreons see that the people of YouTube don't? Then I noticed he also has a PayPal. And just for the low price of $22 plus shipping, you can get yourself a SIJW t-shirt. Social Injustice Warrior. <laughs> so let's put this all together. He wants people to follow him. He calls you VTards. He wants you all to donate your money to him. And he wants all of you to wear the same clothing. So that just leads to ask, what kind of a hive-like cult is this man operating? V Infuso, the social injustice warrior.